Joining us on a special two-part uh, edition of our Signal Conversations is Mike Masnick, a founder of the TechDirt uh, blog and website, um, and a multi-decade commentator on the impact of policy on technology. Um, Mike is a go-to guy for me to understand uh, policy implications, everything from privacy to uh, content moderation, First Amendment law, and basically everything that all of a sudden has been catapulted to the front of the conversation as it relates to how businesses and large tech platforms manage their uh, myriad of problems that uh, now have become hot button issues in politics. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Welcome to Signal, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about all this stuff. So let's start, uh, which we'll get right in here with um, the first of our two sections, which has to do with content moderation. Now, um, this has become a, a big issue for marketers and brands as they try to find ways to ensure that their marketing messaging is what they call brand safe. Um, you know, not next to content that might be objectionable or harmful. But, but more recently, content that might be misinformation or disinformation, which of course has become a very big hot button issue with the election of 2020 and beyond. Um, you know, they want safe spaces basically for their marketing. Why can't uh, the big platforms provide those spaces? <laughs> That's a, a big question. Uh, you know, I, I think that a lot of people underestimate the the scale and size of, of this particular issue, you know, uh, content moderation for, you know, even small communities is incredibly difficult a at a certain scale. It becomes impossible. There is simply no way to, you know, review millions, hundreds of millions, billions of pieces of content every single day, recognize not just what's in that content and what it means, but also the wider context around it. Uh, and to understand, is it actually disinformation? You know, how, how do you define disinformation? How do you figure out, you know, any of this stuff? You know, does it even violate your policies? Is it, you know, does it involve something that was said off platform that now on platform suddenly changes the meaning of it? Is there some wider context in the world that has an impact? You know, is it in a different language? Is it using, you know, code? Is it using euphemisms? You know, the ability to, to figure all that out uh, is incredibly difficult, even on a small scale. And then you put it on a scale that, that most of us, including myself, can't even comprehend. Uh, it becomes right. impossible. There is, you know, no matter what you do, uh, there is no way to to perfectly moderate all content on one of these websites. What's interesting to me is that uh, big big platforms like um, uh, YouTube and or Facebook have said, "Hey, don't worry, we've got this." You know, we do moderate the content. We have tens of thousands of people that work for us um, moderating the content. We got it. Um, and they've been saying that now for several years, and and it seems like um, maybe they don't got it. So the debate has moved uh, around a particular uh, uh, piece of legislation from the mid '90s um, called the Communications Decency Act, uh, and a particular section of that legislation which has been central to this idea of content moderation. What is Section 230 and why do some think that repealing it might be a solution? So in its most basic terms, Section 230, which is a very simple, very short law, it's worth reading. I think a lot of people commenting on it have never even read it, but at its most basic level, it says two things. The first thing it says is that a website should not be held liable for content that was created by somebody else. It's just a you know, proper application of liability. If someone defames somebody else, you blame the person who actually did the defaming, not the service that hosts the content. There is a second part of it, which is that it actually encourages some level of moderation in that it says that if you do some moderation, you know, the, the, the example with the phone company is often, you know, completely hands off, we're not going to do anything. But with uh, websites, you know, they want to do some moderation because if you don't do any moderation, then you get spam, you get abuse, you get a har harassment. 
Uh, and there were a few cases in the early 90s, including one, which was uh, uh, the Prodigy case, uh, that they said, because you do some moderation to try and make your platform family friendly, therefore, anything that you did not moderate, you are now liable for. And Section 230 was explicitly designed to wipe that out and therefore encourage some level of moderation and saying, if you do some moderation, you are not then liable for other content that was left up. How, how is the First Amendment playing into 230? And is this, uh, 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 you know, is this a is this the right way to think about the interplay between this law and the First Amendment? Yeah, I think it's it's a really important point, and it's one that a lot of people miss. I think both sides of the debate are are missing uh, the role that the First Amendment plays here. Most of these decisions are really protected by the First Amendment. The First Amendment, beyond the the sort of headline parts of the First Amendment that most people know about, also includes uh, a, a right against compelled speech. The government cannot force you to, to speak things that you don't believe in or to host speech that you disagree with. It also includes within it, and, and it's not, you know, this is based on the way the courts have ruled over the years. The First Amendment also includes uh, a, a right of association, including not associating with certain people. So most of these decisions around content moderation really are protected by the First Amendment, and that's in, in all different directions. Um, and any effort to, to force companies to moderate in a specific way, uh, and that includes doing no moderation at all. Some some Republicans certainly have, have pushed for rules that say no moderation at all, while some Democrats have pushed for rules that say much more stringent moderation. Both of those approaches almost certainly would uh, violate the First Amendment and would almost certainly be struck down, especially by you know this particular Supreme Court. Um, because that would be the government telling private actors uh, what to say, essentially, right? Yeah, or or what what speech they have to host. Um, and so, you know, there was a case uh, just uh, well uh, now a year and a half ago uh, that touched on some of this stuff. And in a ruling by Brett Kavanaugh, he laid out that you know these companies have a right to associate or not associate uh, as they want. And, and it is very, very unlikely that, that you would uh, move what's called state action, uh, state actor doctrine onto these companies, that they are private companies, they are not government entities, they are not bound by the First Amendment, and, and instead they have First Amendment protections that allow them to say, I do not want to host this speech, I do not want to associate with, with this individual or this group. So I'm going to put myself back in, in, in the, you know, in the seats of, of our, of our audience here. Okay. So if a, uh, these platforms really can't moderate the speech at the scale that this speech is happening on their platforms and B all this talk of repealing 230 isn't really a silver bullet and going to fix the problem. <laughs> What is a way to fix the problem? Do you have any ideas about uh, what a, another approach might be that, that that could get us to a place where uh, these platforms are safe uh, for brands to 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 engage with at scale as they have been for the past decade? I mean, I think there are, there are a lot of different issues there, um, and and certainly some of it is you know defining what what problem it is that you're really trying to solve um, and, and making sure that that something you know makes sense but one of the approaches that I I think is really interesting and it's one that I've written about and uh, and Twitter has has recently embraced is this idea of moving away from this system where we have these giant, silos, companies that have full control over their audience to one that is more like the early internet, which I refer to as, as a protocol-based system rather than a platform system. And that's where you have an underlying technology um, that, you know, the, the best sort of example of this is email, right? I mean, there's all different ways to implement email and you can have different different email setups. You can use Gmail, which many people use. Um, and so you still have large companies that play in that space. But if you don't trust Google and, or you don't trust the way Gmail is run, you can easily switch mm -hmm. to a different platform. Uh, 
and yet still communicate with everybody who uses Gmail. You know, right now, if you don't trust Facebook and you leave Facebook, you can no longer communicate with the people on Facebook. Uh, there, there's, you know, you're you're stuck. That it's a complete silo. Whereas with email, you can move to a different provider, and and that does a bunch of things, including you know creating very strong incentives for the different email providers, including a company like Google, to be a good actor uh, and not to not to do uh, things that that drive people away. Um, and so I think if we were to move social media to a setup that was more based on protocols where different implementations were there, you would have more competition, you would have uh, a variety of innovation uh, and people could innovate in different ways. It wouldn't just be left to Facebook and Twitter and YouTube to make the 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 innovations that are necessary. You would have a lot more, and you could have people sort of opt in to their own comfort level. You know, part of the issue with the content moderation debate is everybody has their own standards for what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, and yet we expect the companies to sort of come up with this universal standard, which which is an impossibility. Whereas if you had a protocol based setup. You know, people could opt in to different levels of standards, and that includes advertisers, right? I mean, advertisers could say, you know, I will, I would like my ads to appear in these kinds of spaces with these kinds of setups and these kinds of rules, and you could do that much more easily and more fine grain the the targeting uh, if you had a protocol based setup rather than relying solely on you know one single company based in Mountain View or Menlo Park or whatever. Right now, now I mean that sounds really cool uh and and like a nirvana but it also it also sounds like something that um uh would be very hard to do as i understand it what you're suggesting is that that we we and and it's a royal we it's the whole ecosystem of of the tech industry the marketers uh public policy everybody involved would sort of we would evolve to a essentially a new architecture underpinning how the internet works is that is that a fair way of putting it <laughs> yes i i uh you know just a just a modest proposal <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to do it but yeah you know i i think it is it is big it is ambitious um but it is the way the internet used to work and and it is sort of you know where many of us realize the promise of the internet so i think it's a worthwhile goal to think about and i think that you're exactly right that that you know there are big challenges in terms of actually getting to that point. Um, but as, as I mentioned, we've already seen you know Twitter suggest that they are very interested in this approach and they're sort of trying to move towards that approach. I think the incentive structures may become that this becomes more and more appealing. You know, we mentioned that you know these companies are hiring tons and tons tens of thousands of moderators they're investing in all sorts of technology and it's still not doing enough and they're getting tons of pressure from politicians from all over the world from all different political perspectives and the cost to them gets increasingly high uh, and so sooner or later it becomes worth it for them to realize like maybe this entire approach is wrong maybe we should have a different approach that that takes the onus off of us to be making all of these decisions and allows for it to be more democratic more distributed more out there and and allows for that to, to happen uh, something to think about uh for everybody and and, and an exciting you know hopefully trend building uh across the internet uh, Mike Masnick, thank you. We're going to now move on to our next section. And I would encourage anyone watching this to watch part two, where we're going to get into the issues of uh, privacy uh, and your data. Um, so that's up next. Thanks very much, Mike.